works. Um, and what I then do is I, I say, if I wanted to represent this block in 2D or 3D as a single homogeneous block of rock with a constant permeability, so how would I find that constant permeability for this fraction network? I would figure out the ratio between the flow rate of fluid I could put through that block and the pressure drop that you apply. So I can create a small model of this, look at these pressure drop and rate relationships, and then come up with an effective permeability. So these fractures here are all very nice, but they're not geologically realistic. So those fractures on, on my right-hand side here are parallel, smooth plates, straight lines. Real geological fractures, especially in a geothermal system, are likely to have mineral deposition in them. So geothermal reservoirs likely to have fractures that look like this. They're very rough, they've had all sorts of deposition of minerals such as calcite within them. So I would like my computational model to be able to understand how do you treat rough fractures. Once I do that, then the goal is to take um, permeability, assign a permeability for this little piece of rock, honouring the fractures that you may have in there, whether they're fractures that you've observed from logs, whether you're, they're fractures that you've populated statistically, and then you could go through a process of what's called upscaling, where you could do this for many, many volumes and then start to aggregate the volumes into larger and larger volumes of rock and come up with effective permeabilities for those to make your models computationally efficient. Um, I'm not to worry about that one. What this does is gives you a way to think about the change in permeability you get as you get more and more calcite deposition. So this becomes then an interface for reservoir engineers to work with uh, geochemists, for example, who can help um, give information about how much deposition you might expect as pressures and temperatures change, as fluid compositions change. So this chart, uh, the, the scaling doesn't, doesn't really matter, it's in terms of these lattice units, but this chart talks about how the permeability will change as you get more and more deposition. So if the original permeability was here, I can lose half the permeability, even more of the permeability, as deposition progresses and as I get more calcite in the, in the fractures. And if I'm losing permeability, then I'm losing productivity, I'm losing flow rate in those wells. So it becomes quite important to understand that the engineers understand, is permeability likely to change because of geochemical effects? I'll move to another scale, quite a dramatically different scale. I'll move to a scale uh, where I look at modelling in what's called the Taupo Volcanic Zone. So the Taupo Volcanic Zone is this area here. So this is the whole North Island of New Zealand. Uh, so I'm focused on this area. And this is where most of our geothermal producing fields are. And these fields are controlled by volcanism and magnetism, uh, faulting, and then the combination of the two leads to geothermal activity in these areas in yellow. So those are the, the areas that we know. Many of them are, are reserved for cultural reasons or scientific reasons. So we don't produce from each of these. Uh, we probably only produce from maybe 40% of them, because many, many of them are protected for other reasons. So to think about fluid scale at that scale, so I've gone from working at sort of millimetre scales or less out to a crustal scale. So now I want to take a piece of rock and do essentially an experiment that we can only do in the computer because, you know, while I could do a core experiment in the lab with a piece of rock this big, on the computer I can start to think about what would happen if I took a piece of rock that's 20 kilometres this way um, 25 kilometres this way and start to think about 
what happens is that is extended. So the Taupo volcanic zone is, is extending. This end is traveling six millimeters per year this way. This has been pulled six millimeters per year this way. And I'll look at an example where I have a fault. So we're just taking a block of rock and extending it and try to understand what happens first of all to the stress state in the rock. Is the rock increasingly stressed? Is the rock going to fail? Is the rock going to create new faults? And are those changes in mechanical stress going to lead to changes in permeability, which then lead to changes in fluid flow? So we apply two different constitutive laws. The upper part is an elastic material, a more Coulomb material. The lower part is a viscous material with a power law of creep. So in the, in the model, what we um, look at is the fact that the area along uh, the fault is going to influence the temperature distribution. So the panel on the right is a temperature distribution with the hotter colors being higher temperatures. And you see that the temperature distribution follows the fault, but in a way that's asymmetric. And that is related to the permeability um, along the fault area. And that permeability is connected back in the model to the mechanical stress. So what you see is the fault is coming up here and you see most of the surface expression, um, if we back up, most of the surface expression is on this side, on the hanging wall side. And this is what the computer predicted would be happening, that the, the surface heating would be on the hanging wall side. We work with geologists who say, yeah, that's actually what we see. So this panel here is from a site called Tacopia. There is a fault here, pyro fault cutting into the earth. And most of the thermal alterations on the ground are on the hanging wall side of the fault. And that uh, matches qualitatively with what we see in terms of temperature change if you look at the model results in map view. So that is a very pleasing um, calibration of the model that it did make sense geologically. It did help un the geologists understand some of the things that they see in the field. If we think about um, the Taupo volcanic zone again and think about um, uh, where fluids are going in terms of where does recharge into these systems happen? Because when we're modeling, we're really quite interested in where is the influx into our systems coming from? We're extracting hot fluid from somewhere, and how is that hot fluid being recharged? So there is, is there colder fluid coming in from the surface that's flowing through the system and being heated? Where is that fluid coming from? is that being supplemented by our own injection strategies. Because in New Zealand, it's very important to us that our geothermal fields are managed um, sustainably. So our indigenous people, the Maori people of New Zealand, they want there to be geothermal resource available for their great, great grandchildren. So some of the modeling work we do helps us understand that. So one thing that we have looked at is calculations like this when we map now at the whole Taupo volcanic scale. So now we take a block of rock that's 50 kilometers by 80 kilometers by 8 kilometers deep. We cut it up into very large blocks. So when I say the blocks are 500 by 500 by 400 meters, what I mean is I'm taking that volume of rock, 500 by 500 by 400, and I'm assigning it one permeability, one porosity. So if you go into a, a field study in geology, you would see that there is variability well below that scale. So we have to assign average properties to these blocks to make this model tractable. And then what we can map is we can map out zones of um, where the recharge happens. So for instance, all these, 
all this yellow area is fluid that kind of recharges into field number three. All these, this area is fluid that recharges field number one. And you can then track what the residence time is that the fluid has in the subsurface in the scale of um, zero to 100,000 years. Um, and that, again, helps us understand um, some of the things that the geochemists can measure. So they have found that uh, that makes sense in terms of some of the geochemical aging that they have done on these fluids. So understanding uh, what is connected to what um, helps a great deal in managing these fields. I want to also uh, briefly talk about what my PhD students are doing at the moment. Um, so that will give you some sense of some of the, the wider work being done in my, my personal research group. So the first student I want to talk about is, is Angela Prieto. She originally comes from Colombia and she is a geologist. But again, she wants to work with reservoir engineers in terms of making our modeling efforts better. So she has data sets here, um, porosity, permeability, and various textural measures. So what Andrea is, Angela is interested in doing is understanding how various measures of texture that you could observe in, in hand samples or with very simple um, microscope magnification, how things that you can easily observe in terms of texture relate back to porosity and permeability. So she has built up a database. The database now has about 450 samples. Um, where she's relating those hand observed properties back to porosity and permeability. And she's working through a strategy of what's called rock typing. And this is an idea that's borrowed from the petroleum industry. They're quite well advanced with this. She's using um, artificial intelligence methods of organizing maps to classify her data, to classify her samples into rock types that are similar and rock types that are different. And that helps us then map porosity and permeability uh, through the systems. I have another student, uh, Ariel Vidal. He is from Chile. Uh, and he is also a geologist. And he is interested in um, the idea that we measure um, properties of reservoirs at a range of, of boreholes here. And from a sparse set of well data, we could, could create many models that all honor the same data. So if I have this data set here, all of these three-dimensional models may honor that same data set. So because we can build many possible three-dimensional descriptions of the reservoir, we have some uncertainty. And we need ways to manage that uncertainty. So he is working with ways to perform um, fluid flow simulations very quickly, uh, to perform fluid flow simulations again using some kind of artificial intelligence machine learning techniques to help um, narrow down that set of geological models based on things like subsurface temperature profiles. So if I have a temperature log down some of the wells, then I can start to rule some of those out. I can then start to um, use optimization-based techniques to understand uh, distributions of rock properties and um, rock types. I have um, a French student, Jeremy Rafal, who is interested in induced seismicity. So induced seismicity is the idea that if I'm withdrawing fluid from the subsurface, that may trigger earthquakes, if I'm withdrawing fluid or injecting fluid. So in New Zealand, we have some very highly instrumented geothermal fields with micro-seismic sensors. So micro-seismic sensors can measure earthquakes down to a level of minus two on the Richter scale. 
So a minus two is an extremely tiny event. You need to have sensors deployed down well bores in the subsurface to even see those. Uh, this kind of activity helps us understand, again, connectivity in the subsurface, but it's also quite important in engineered geothermal systems. So we have access to the Paralana data set where they, in Australia, they would try to create a geothermal system by injecting cold fluid underground to create a net network of natural fractures. So these clouds talk about um, time, distance away from the well bore, and the size of the dot talks about the size of the event. So he is now trying to create a model that reproduces what was seen at Paralana, using quite an innovative approach to modelling this induced seismicity, because it is impossible to exactly predict earthquakes. If we knew how to do that, then that would be a very good thing. But you can often only predict sort of the the average behaviour, the sort of statistical distribution. But he is doing very well at getting um, a model that does replicate what happened at Paralana. I have another student from uh, Jong Chan Kim from Korea. He is interested in the mathematics of how you do all this, how you model heat transfer, mass transfer, um, and then the, the mechanical stress changes. So. He's focusing on a, a site in New Zealand uh, at one of our geothermal systems where they started a reinjection program and in return they did see an increase in the rate of seismicity. So he's trying to understand to what extent that's connected to the injection, to what extent it's con connected to larger regional tectonic effects. And then the final student working with me is uh, originally from Holland, um, and he is doing something quite different. He's looking at the role of reservoir modelling in regulation, because when companies go for permits, they have to give the results of their modelling of how the system is going to behave to the regulators. And he's looking at um, uh, what data is reported, what data should be reported, uh, how modelling can be used in reservoir management from a regulatory perspective. Because in New Zealand, our, our regulators are getting quite sharp. They've got good engineers working for them too. Um, so we're looking at kind of that process of interchange and thinking about uh, what, what can we measure, what can we model to really understand long-term sustainability in these systems from both sides. Um, so that wraps up the sort of material I prepared. If anyone has any questions or comments, um, do feel free to email me um, any time. Thank you. Thank you.